Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Coffee from here at Lowell Observatory. Uh, I'm Jeff Hall, director and an astronomer here at Lowell, and I'm here today with uh, Dr. Gerard Van Bell of our faculty, who's uh, appeared on some Cosmic Coffee episodes previously. You can find him training on the definition of Pluto, uh, among other things. Um, today, we're going to tackle a slightly uh, different topic than, than maybe we've done before, and this is actually by request. We'd like to give a shout out this morning to our very young uh, listener, Alex Gavin, up in the Seattle area. Good morning. Hey, Alex. This was kind of his idea to talk about um, spaceships in movie and how, how space flight and space travel has been depicted sometimes uh, more realistically, sometimes somewhat less realistically on the silver screen. And we're gonna cover pretty much the past century. And we got a bunch of different renderings um, that Girard has compiled that will sort of step us through how filmmakers over the last century have interpreted getting from one place to another out there in the universe. So we're clearly starting um, not at the most modern of, of uh, examples here. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, Jeff, and good to be here. Um, this is a, uh, a French film, and what, what I find really interesting about this is, you know, we've had movies and we've had films in existence since about the turn of the last century, so about the year 1900, and one of the very first things that was thought of for a feature-length film was a voyage into space. This is something that has really sparked the imagination. It's pretty wild that way that uh, you know people have been really fascinated by this, and um, and so there was a 1903 film called uh, well, it was French, but the English translation is A Voyage to the Moon, and um, it really uh, riffs off of the Jules Verne uh, books on the subject from about uh, 20 or 30 years earlier. Um, uh, he wrote a book about the. I believe it was the Baltimore Gun Club figuring out how to build a giant cannon in Florida of all places and uh, send a voyage to the moon, which is very prescient, I thought. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the idea was um, you would basically build a cannon deep into the ground that was pointed straight up in the general direction of the moon. And uh, you would have a survivable acceleration, <laughs> uh, which they actually discuss uh, at some length in the, in the Jules Verne book uh, to try and figure out how to, how to make this survivable. And uh, then they would shoot a shell to the moon. And then you would, of course, uh, upon getting to the moon, have a, uh, a livable atmosphere and have all sorts of adventures. So uh, this was uh, 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 filmed in the, the 1903 film. Um, what's interesting about this is how it's really kind of a, uh, it's a fantasy film, I would say. And a lot of the, the earlier films, um, uh, for the first 30, 40 years of this sort of filmmaking, was really kind of uh, fantastical rather than uh, having a lot of, uh, of the engineering and the, the hard science that flowed into the topic when we actually started for real to think about going to the moon. And so we'll see that theme echoed throughout. Right, you can see that in the very fantastic um, artwork uh, imagined for the surface of the moon, of course, as well as the spacecraft. I think um, to your points, the, you know, clearly the, the inspiration for some of this, particularly Jules Verne, you know, uh, those, those are interesting reads. And clearly he, he put a lot of thought and effort into trying to create an environment, whether it's under the sea or to the moon or the center of the earth, um, that made for kind of a plausible adventure and they're fun books to read. I'll also note, of course, 1903, when we, we first started getting off the ground in Kitty Hawk. So clearly our, our imagination was towards um, the air and then space beyond. That's right. So the, the next thing that, that I wanted to highlight was going forward about 20 years. And then we started to get into the, the Flash Gordon epics okay. and uh, with, you can see the, the super high tech special effects going on here. I'm surprised they didn't set the model on fire. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the, um, 
I think the 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 films and the movies for Flash Gordon came out uh, after the the very popular comic strip serial. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Those... With old Buster Crab in the the starring role. I remember seeing some of these as a kid. I found growing up as a kid, I found uh, the old comic books actually available um, with uh, the. Um, the, the library we had in town and they're a great read. They're actually uh, very impressive to, to, to look at. So yep. Here, here's an interesting question coming in from uh, Glenn Frank wondering, is it more fantasy because that's the genre that was of interest or because the science at that point was not well developed or understood as for how we would actually get to the moon? I would suspect the latter that, um, that the science wasn't well understood and that the science was still, starting to still get in the process of separating itself from kind of natural philosophy at that time. Um, so um, one thing that was very important that Flash Gordon gave us was of course, for sci-fi, the screen crawl, um, which we all are familiar with uh, many, many decades later in the form of the Star Wars screen crawl. In fact, uh, which film was it? There was one that came out recently now that we have these new Star Wars films uh, that did not have a screen crawl and people were aghast that that right. detail was overlooked. Yeah, I can't remember really, if that was... you know, Star Wars, of course, when the original one came out, ne needing to set up the premise so people would understand what was going on, but clearly paying homage to some of these, these earlier sci-fi movies. Yeah. And it, there's a lot of uh, references like that in Star Wars, and it actually propagates over to the music. If you go back to one of the earlier Cosmic Coffees, I was talking with uh, Larry Lang and Charles Latshaw from the Flag Symphony about music in space. And uh, Charles points out how liberally John Williams borrowed from composers like Holst and Stravinsky to sort of pay homage to some of these uh, surreal uh, scenes that were created for the movie. Mm -hmm. Cool. So even moving still further forward, this is a uh, image from Forbidden Planet in the uh, the 1950s. And uh, here's where we're starting to close out the, the more fantastical era of, uh, of early sci-fi. And this clearly has some influences from the, uh, the UFO craze that was starting to turn on, I believe the first uh, purported UFO sighting happened in 1947 above Mount Rainier. Um, and, uh, you know, and so you can see some of that influence there. A fine film by Leslie Nelson, I might say. Right. And of course, the famous uh, flying saucer, which you see in, in so many movies, and that's been carried right up into the 90s with, with things like Mars Attacks, which was intentionally showing these ridiculous flying saucers. But this, uh, for the 1950s, uh, and we're talking about saucers, um, we don't have an example of it here in the show, but one you must go see is what's widely regarded, or at least by some, as the worst film of all time, which is Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's sort of zombie grave robbers um, that come to Earth. And, and some wags have pointed out that one of the reasons the film is so bad is they apparently, you know, eight plans failed and they needed the ninth to, to make any progress. <laughs> but there, it's famous for what appears to be a, a special effect that's a, a paper plate that's been set on fire and pulled upward by a string. So <laughs> clearly, clearly not on the largest of budgets here. <laughs> and, you know, budget is an interesting question because as these films become more sophisticated, you know, the special effects to simulate what's going on uh, does play a role. Yes, but we, um, when we get a little bit later, we can talk about the budget to impact ratio, which is not <laughs> one to one to one. <laughs> That's right. So around this time, we are, though, starting to see um, uh, actual hard sci-fi and actual engineering starting to influence some of the, some of the films. And so this film that I'm showing here is from, this image is from 1950, a film called Destination Moon. And it's really notable for featuring a lot of space art and designs from uh, Chelsea Bonestell, who is a very famous uh, space artist who really depicted a lot of things. Uh, this film was also informed by uh, a certain Werner von Braun, who uh, went on to be really the chief architect of the the American land uh, manned moon landing program, uh, crewed landing program, and um, 
the um, you know uh, Bonestell and Von Braun also collaborated on uh, the famous Collier magazine article series of the 50s that really helped be a blueprint and a guide for ideas on what we can do in space when all of a sudden things were set in a panic in 1957 by the launch of Sputnik and suddenly the US was grasping at straws on what they could do. Right, right. And what, what you'll see, I think, um, uh, referring to the space art and this is comparing to the 1903 rendering, our, our general idea of you know, what space might look like and what the surface of the moon looked like. This is a much more realistic uh, rendering, actually a fairly convincing one. Um, comment coming in on the chat feed again from Glenn Frank saying, yes, um, watching the previous movie, you expect Leslie Nielsen to break into comedy, but then he stays into drama. And of course, that's a, a reference to the very out of character role in Airplane, which I think came out in 1980. So I was about 16 and I remember um, laughing until my sides ached at just the nonstop stream of sophomoric jokes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, he was also in the, the Police Squad series. Is that right? Yep. yep. Which was yep. He sort of forged a whole new career in slapstick comedy. Yep. All right. So starting springing from this this breadboard of, uh, of hard sci fi, we now come into really one of the, the juggernauts of sci fi, which is the uh, the uh, Star Trek series featuring, of course, everyone's favorite spaceship, the Enterprise. And uh, I heard I, I heard a interesting, probably somewhat apocryphal story about this model, which was that um, it was sitting on the desk of Gene Roddenberry and one of the producing execs came in and it was upside down and it was supposed to be that way. And the exec, the, one of the people who was going to pay for this, picked it up and flipped it into the orientation we see now and said, hey, I love that. And that's how it became to look like this rather than upside down. And uh, the, uh, I think the, the provenance on that story has also been clouded by uh, the fact that there actually is a, uh, a, 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 a situation which happened on a TV guide series, a TV guide page where they actually did print it upside down. And so you can find that, but, uh, yeah, the, the fact that they flipped it upside down might be mm -hmm. kind of an uh, interesting thing to further research. And Star Trek, you know, this is a good example of, of what I was talking about before, which is the, the budget to impact ratio. So of course this is made for TV in the late 60s. So this isn't CGI, right? They're doing it with models mm -hmm. and of necessity, they're doing it on a, a shoestring budget. It, you know. And yet I would say, you know, if we talk about favorite moments in depictions of space flight or space travel, I think my absolute favorite is the episode from the second season of this uh, series, The Doomsday Machine, um, where, you know, it's just one of these great cliffhanger endings as Captain Kirk is in the crippled constellation, which is the same class as the Enterprise, or not Captain, um, yeah, and, and uh, the, but the point there is, you know, it's very, very low budget, um, you know, primitive special effects by the standards of modern depiction and yet the storytelling and the character of Commodore Decker who watched his entire crew you know die on the fourth planet and couldn't do anything about it that's that's something that you know the the welfare of the team is something that weighs heavily on the captain of any ship I would yeah. say so, um you know that's it's just very impactful and a good good uh, point I think to leave with with Alex and all our other viewers that Special effects are only supportive to good storytelling and really well-drawn characters. That's right. Yeah. The, one of the things that I think is sometimes lost in sci-fi is that sci-fi is a way to create settings and situations which uh, help further explore the human condition, but it is, should not be the story itself. Uh, <laughs> when you do that, you get lost most times. Uh, the, um, the other thing I'll note on uh, budgetary limitations of, of sci-fi is um, it, it is true that uh, when they were trying to craft the Star Trek series and they were thinking about, okay, you have a starship coming to a planet and how do you get to the surface? And they looked at the um, expense involved in having to uh, film and come up with all these scenes of shuttlecrafts going down to the surface. And they just thought, we can't do that. We don't have the money for that. And so out of necessity, they invented the transporter. And uh, which is a very, you know, 
a, a fascinating uh, uh, story device, but also uh, kind of interesting how, you know, that came out of uh, a need rather than a, uh, any sort of scientific creat creativity originally. Oh, and they, I mean, they also invented the flip phone. It's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And, and, you know, you look at the tricorder and the sliding doors, it's amazing, you know, how much technology uh, Roddenberry and producers foresaw when they had to render some of this stuff in a way that would help drive the stories forward. Yeah. Now, what I find interesting about the, the Star Trek series is how you immediately have a, um, a bifurcation in the good guy's ship versus the bad guy's ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, much different lines. This definitely has cut so much more of a sinister jib. Uh, it's, it's interesting how they, uh, they, managed, they went ahead and did that uh, with this. And so we'll, we, we actually will see that happen again and again throughout um, the, uh, the movies we, we are starting to look at now as well. Oh, absolutely. And it's definitely that's the, you know, the art of, of creating an emotional response uh, in the viewer's mind just through things like design and color and lines. It's, it's, it's amazing how those, those connotations uh, uh, make their way into our brain. So the next one I'm going to show is where things get very, very nice. kind of hard science. Um, and so this is uh, really in the same time frame. So uh, uh, Star Trek first came out in 1966, I think is the right date. Um, and, yeah. and this is from 2001, which was uh, a Stanley Kubrick film in 1968, one of the titans of, of uh, filmmaking that uh, had a um, no, no uh, attention to detail spared. Uh, on this, so that was, the, was renowned for that. <laughs> yes, so the old the old saw goes that uh, the moon landings were faked, and that the U.S. government contracted Stanley Kubrick to actually do the filming, but he was such a uh, he had such attention to detail he insisted that it be filmed on location. <laughs> right. So he would have. <laughs> so, which is actually, I mean, it's very interesting to to look at uh, this film with how precisely. Uh, Kubrick tried to get the details of space flight and this sort of thing. And, and I contend that, you know, he, he titled the film 2001 because this was his vision of what space flight would look like in 2001. And I've always contended that he was exactly right, that space flight would have looked exactly like this in 2001 if the level of investment that was going on during the Apollo years in the 60s, which is about 4% of the GDP, had continued throughout um, now, the truth of it was actually, and this is kind of sad, is that already by 1968, um, the, even before the first landing of a crew on the moon, uh, the, um, the investment had already started to tumble sharply. And nowadays is about one sixteenth of the annual investment that was happening during the Apollo years, it's about a quarter of GDP rather than 4% of GDP. Right. But I, I think you're exactly right with that kind of uh, investment. You know, obviously, this is the, the space station that's rendered in 2001 is, is vastly beyond the ISS. This is vastly beyond space, space, spacecraft we've sent to other planets. But, you know, the rendering is so so scientifically rigorous. Um, mm -hmm. And this this remains one of my absolute favorite films. In fact, I remember dimly remember my, my dad taking me down to the old state theater in Farmville, Virginia to see this <laughs> when I was about five. And um, I, I am told that I sat there mesmerized for two hours and 20 minutes of Stanley Kubrick pacing. And, and I, I think this film changed my life. I, th I think it was uh, such a, a profound uh, impact on the, the, the potential of, of what's out there. So certainly one of my, my very um, fav favorites. Um, Maybe uh, comment respond to from um, Geo Carlisle um, says, uh, oh, hi, George. Yeah, um, so argues Von Braun was actually not involved in Destination Moon. Um, Robert Heinlein was the source of the story and much of the technical uh, advice on the film. Was, was, it, was Von Braun with a different one? Von, so that's my mistake. Von Braun's involvement with Bone Stell was with the Collier series. But Heinlein was, uh, yeah, okay. the commentator is exactly right. Heinlein was the one that uh, chimed in on this. Okay. Thank you for the correction. Yeah, I have a couple more images from 2001. This yeah. is the, yeah. the Moonlander from 2001. Um, and uh, 
the iconic spaceship, uh, uh, space station, and the uh, uh, the Pan Am aircraft, the hypersonic aircraft that flew up there. And yeah. I, what I always thought was actually really uh, fascinating about the space station was how it clearly was still under construction. Uh, that was really neat to kind of see that you know work in progress. That uh, it made a bit of a nod towards not quite everything being all shiny and pristine in the in in outer space. That it was an ongoing enterprise. Yep, and this is of course another one where uh, there was a very um, detailed and, and thorough effort to to place the right music with the imagery. And of course, Kubrick borrowed heavily from classical music. You may remember uh, the Blue Danube waltz being played here to the docking yep. scene. But then many of the more um, uh, out there scenes, such as the Stargate sequence, used the music of uh, contemporary composer um, George Ligeti which if you just listen to it, it, it certainly takes an ear that's attuned to, to something past Mozart, um, but, but it, it was exactly the right thing. And as I, I think I read once, um, Ligeti resisted having his music appear in the film and Kubrick just went ahead and used it anyway because that was <laughs> much to Ligeti's surprise when it came out. Oh man. <laughs> uh, and here's one last view of... Uh... 2001 showing the business end of uh, the the Odyssey spacecraft oh, sorry, Discovery, Discovery space. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And again, here's here's a case where the the physical design looks plausible. Obviously, this is something that would have to be built in space, but you know, placing the engines away from the, the the habitation area with its little centrifuge inside, so the astronauts would have some sense of, of gravity. It's all just really nicely thought out. And of course, for the the book, you had the the very careful mind of Arthur C. Clarke behind all of it. <clears throat> yep. Now, going from uh, that view, uh, we now have uh, the mm -hmm. 70s coming on in full force. And the real mm -hmm. uh, juggernaut of the 70s was, of course, Star Wars. Um, I've cheated a bit and I've pulled an image not from the uh, actual 1977 film, but uh, from the updated re-release, uh, which has prettier spacecraft rendered. But um, I always found it fascinating, uh, again, looking at, you know, what sort of things are the good guys in and what sort of things are the bad guys in? And so in this case, we have very airplane looking spacecraft that the, the good guys are in. And meanwhile, the bad guys are flying toasters around. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, and then even the characters themselves, right? Princess Leia wears white, Darth yeah. wears black. You know, it's 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 drawn about as clearly as it possibly could have been. And, and you know, I remember seeing this um, when I was thirteen. And and you know, I've had discussions with with my sons about this. Who noted, I mean, I, again, this is this is models. I mean, this is ILM principally flying models around green screens and uh, perhaps looking dated to the modern CGI eye. But in nineteen seventy seven, nobody had seen yeah. anything like this. You just sat there in in awe of what they accomplished, uh, a real watershed in, in cinema. Yeah. Uh, also happening in the 70s was one of my favorites, which yeah. was the, the, it was a TV series, not necessarily a, a movie, but uh, certainly uh, put together along kind of cinematic themes of uh, Space 1999. And this was the, one of the Eagle spacecraft on Space 1999. And it was actually a fairly uh, well-budgeted series in terms of the effects and uh, that sort of thing, which, you know, to, you know, 12 year old me when I first saw this was very eye popping. Um, it does highlight the, the fact that uh, very good special effects can't make up for really bad plot and <laughs> writing and, <laughs> uh, so we, um, in leading up into this particular uh, chat, uh, Jeff and I and uh, the rest of the, our, our crew, we were talking about films of the 80s, and we didn't have a lot of good at spacecraft examples from the 80s. And so uh, there's a few places where in like Alien or Aliens, the spacecraft are kind of the, uh, they're the backdrop, but they're not so much uh, a element or a character in the the films and so we don't have a lot from there and so uh we skip into the 90s actually with the next actually, slot we have a comment that's come in quickly oh. but i certainly agree with you about the 80s um you, you know yeah yeah the, the spaceships and and aliens were more the sets than than 
things like in Star Wars. Um, Glenn Frank yep. correctly, Star Wars kind of reverted to the Buck Rogers mentality of a fantasy more than the plausible 2001 story ships. Uh, um, and clearly that, that's the case, uh, very intentional. And, you know, I'm personally, I'm always willing to suspend disbelief for just pure storytelling and narrative drive. Um, and, you know, as long as the movie is honest about that's what its intention is. Yeah. And, you know, it was a, the original Star Wars was a, a grand entertainment that, that, that worked on all levels. <laughs> I, I think that's exactly right. I, I, I always like to call out the distinction that, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek are both excellent uh, worlds in their own right. Uh, but Star Trek is sci-fi and Star Wars is fantasy. And, <laughs> and these separate the two. So, yep. um, one thing I, one spaceship I wanted to call attention to was from the, uh, the mega disaster flick deep impact. Yep. And I was, that was a, that was the good meteor strike film, uh, of that era. And, um, they had this spacecraft in there called the Mosiah, which I, I think the name itself was kind of silly, but it was a, um, a, a element of the story, which I thought was really well done because basically they're on a short timeline. They're trying to intercept this, this uh, rock from hitting the earth and they have to throw together a space spaceship. And this is exactly what I would have thrown together if I was doing this job, which is, you know, you make a spacecraft out of spare parts. I mean, there's a shuttle booster here. There's some, I believe these are Russian Zeniths on the back end. You've stolen part of a space shuttle and you've kind of cobbled this together out of what you've, what you have. And that, that seemed like a very, um, legitimate way to support that element of the story. Um, in, in sharp contrast to that was the bad disaster flick of that same year. Hollywood is no, no source of original ideas, which was Armageddon. And uh, they came up with this monster of a, of a spacecraft. The, I think they called it the, the X 71 or something like that, where, you know, I don't know why they've painted this, lightning bolt on the tail or why mm -hmm. this extra wing has shown up on the body above the main wing. I mean, what, what is that going to do? That's not going to do anything. And it was clearly somebody, some designer in Hollywood just kind of threw something together for visual effect on the film without yeah. actually thinking about it. This is kind of like if the space shuttle has been sitting in the forest near Chernobyl for six or seven <laughs> yes. months, you know, it's, it's this horrible um, mutation, but I'll also, I think that I forget when these movies were, but so these were both made for screen and I completely uh, agree with your assessment that deep impact uh, again, they, they tried to do a reasonable job, I think, of listening to their science advisors and, and yeah. recently, right, and, and Armageddon was just silly. Um, and the crown jewel of this era, I think it was 1998, the made-for-TV movie, Asteroid. <laughs> In the first 10 minutes, particularly as an astronomer, I'm sitting on the couch howling because first you have uh, the, the astronomers observing at the, quote, National Observatory. Uh -huh. uh, is a giant neon sign right outside of the dome, which is exactly how we do it. Um, and then, you know, she takes one image of this random star field and sort of holds it up and looks at it by eye and says, oh, my God. You know, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know if they, they claim to have science advisors in the credit, but from start to finish, it's clear they, they didn't listen to a word anybody said. <laughs> and there was also... Never, we have a comment that there, there is a, a thumbs up for Armageddon. So, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder and, and absolutely. There was also the 1979 film Meteor featuring uh, Sean Connery. And uh, I know this all too well because downstairs I have the Meteor pinball machine from that same era, which I am in the process of refurbishing. Uh, and uh, yes, it's... Uh, I've actually just found the back glass for that. So that's very, very there good. Was a, there was, that reminds me, there was a made for TV movie, I think also in the seventies called a fire in the sky. Um, uh, with, I think it was Richard Crenna. And if I, I recall one of my colleagues from um, uh, uh, the, what was then the national Op or the national solar observatory in Tucson. Um, they came to, I think, Kit Peak to film part of that. And, and, he said he remembered the evening they were filming that, but the distinguishing thing is the meteor lands uh, 50 miles outside of Phoenix. And there's this, this great scene towards the end of Phoenix <laughs> being utterly annihilated by Ooh. this meteor strike. <laughs> so moving forward to films that actually listen to their uh, science advisors, uh, most notably we have recently The Martian, um, which is really, uh, you know, there, there are, 
notable exceptions where they deviate a bit from the science, but that they are notable because they are uh, rare. Uh, and so most of it is pretty hard nuts, uh, very, very hard sci-fi. And so they feature a transfer ship, as we see on the screen here, of something that cycles between the Earth and Mars, uh, in addition to what I think is a pretty realistic uh, lander and ascent vehicle you can see right here. And uh, these were things that were done really with getting a lot of feedback from people who actually work at JPL and at NASA and that kind of thing. The, uh, I think the author, uh, Andy Weir, uh, actually progressed through writing the book iteratively in bouncing the chapters off of uh, people who were working at the space agency. Yeah, clearly very realistic depiction. You know, one one plot element that they have to use to set up the story that's a little over the top, but the rest of it was extremely well done. And and you really appreciate when when somebody's trying to to hew to the science and, and tell a really good story in a, in a realistic way. These these kinds of things are inspiring to watch. <laughs> I think it, it makes it actually that much more compelling when it's that much more believable. I mean, the the real kingpin of that is the not sci-fi at all story uh, is Apollo 13, where, you know, in, in uh, commenting about that, I think Tom Hanks remarked that, you know, they really didn't have to make up a lot of stuff when they made that film, that uh, it was pretty dramatic as is, you know, even the dialogue they, they felt was pretty spot on. Right, right. Um a comment or question from uh, from Glenn, is this formula true? Real scientists, astronomers equals automatic sci-fi fan? Um, I don't know, not necessarily. Um, I think there are certainly a number of astronomers out there that have a hard time stomaching, particularly a film like, sorry, Armageddon, <laughs> where, uh, you know, the deviations from reality are so sharp and so repeated that uh, some people have a hard time successfully engaging in a, uh, uh, a suspension of disbelief. Right. And, and there, there are a couple of points that I would add. And, I, I, you know, I, I've never actually read a whole lot of sci-fi. You know, the, the sci-fi books I did read, I certainly enjoyed. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed the various films we've talked about. You know, I think, yeah, as an astronomer, these are these are stories that take place out there on the, the canvas that, that we study. And so there's certainly some, some underlying interest there. But again, it all depends on the story. And, and Gerard and I, I think we might differ on this, but one movie we haven't mentioned yet is Gravity, where there were, you know, clearly... Uh, you know, if you understand anything about orbit transfer, just completely impossible things going on in that movie. Deserves but, a face palm. But <laughs> from my standpoint, the, just the narrative drive and the, the brilliance of the execution, you know, clearly paying homage to Kubrick with this 17 minute opening uh, continuous take. Um, I thought it was outstanding, despite the obvious and, and glaring things that you couldn't do, like going from HST to the, the ISS. I, I thought gravity was uh, visually stunning, you know, a tour de force in that regard. But yeah, hard to stomach because of the, you know, the physics involved that just were totally ignored. You know, right. and it should have been called angular momentum. It should not have been called gravity. But anyway, right. well, and you know, I think in interviews, uh, the director uh, Alfonso Maron was was totally upfront about that. He said, you know, this is not a documentary. This is yeah. a story. And again, like Star Wars, that's that's what they were trying to produce. Um, Glenn asked Martian, great book and movie was too. The author worked at JPL, didn't he? Did he did he work at JPL? Um, I, I wouldn't know for sure one way or the other. I didn't think so, but I thought he worked. He, he basically bounced a lot of ideas off of JPL people, but I, I could be wrong. He, he did. I'm not. I Googled this quickly. It's not clear that he did. Um, and comment from Woody Phillips, the Academy Award for Best Phys Physics goes to The Expanse. I don't know that that's one I'm familiar with. Are you, Gerard? So The Expanse is did not make the cut for this Cosmic Coffee because we were talking about films rather than TV series. I've started watching The Expanse a little bit and I want to get into it more, but I'm, I'm having a hard time doing it because the television in our household is a shared resource between the adults and the much smaller children and they don't quite have a stomach for The Expanse yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I've the I've heard rave reviews of, of The Expanse. For, for your benefit, Jeff, um, The Expanse is basically 
Uh, I think it's set in about a hundred years from now when the asteroids are being colonized and settled mm -hmm. and, and this sort of thing. And, and has, I've heard, I've heard very good things about, uh, how good it does the physics and the, 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 the engineering. Okay. Excellent. I'm yeah. If it's, if it's recent, I really don't have a lot of duty cycles to, to keep up with, with what's going on these days, other than the current state of the pandemic and yeah. how, to, how to try and weave our way through that. Um, hey, come on, you're an empty nester. You have full control of the TV, you know. It's, right. <laughs> so the the last couple of slides I'm going to show actually uh, uh, deviate a bit from film and show reality. Uh, and what I find fascinating about this is this is a uh, spacecraft that's under development by uh, SpaceX. Uh, this is something they call the Starship. Uh, it is actually the top section of an even larger overall craft. Uh, this stacks on top of a thing called the Super Heavy. And um, the kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but the central section of the Starship, they've actually built, uh, you know, on the order of seven or eight copies of this already. And uh, serial numbers uh, five and six have actually done very short hops of uh, about to 300 feet. And um, they are very, very rapidly building this thing for flight. Uh, and so the, the so-called super heavy booster is about half again as tall as this thing and the whole thing stacks up. And what I find fascinating about this in light of the discussion we're having right now is how this spacecraft is actually starting to once again look like the earlier spacecraft from way back when. And uh, there's, there's a very striking uh, resemblance there and how, you know, uh, life is starting to imitate art in that regard. And uh, that kind of cracks me up. But uh, it also, you know, the sort of things that uh, these new space companies are doing, such as SpaceX, but other ones too, um, really uh, indicate to me that, you know, this, this kind of expansive future of, of expansion into the solar system, you know, is actually a, a, a soon to becoming reality. You know, these details that we saw in the movie 2001 uh, are, are starting to finally come true now that we've set the stage for that. Yeah, clearly. And, and, you know, I think where, you know, the vision of 2001 saw this, this enormous leap in um, engineering and our ability to build um, manned spacecraft, say that would go to Jupiter or Saturn, you know, we've seen those kinds of leaps in you know, electronic communication systems and then the kinds of things that are enabling us to do what we're doing right now. And, and I think now that companies like SpaceX, you know, space is, is suddenly and rather abruptly becoming accessible to the private sector. Um, and this is leading to, you know, certain areas where there's potential conflict. You know, we've talked in previous com Cosmic Coffees about dark skies and satellite constellations and just the increasing crowding of space. Um, but, you know, we're, we're potentially on the cusp of seeing a, a, a transformation in the direction that, that 2001 uh, pictured um, those those almost 50 years ago, I guess. Um, there's a quick uh, comment from Heather Fail, uh, a vote for Wallace and Gromit's Of space. course. How would we, which is what, sort of like an obese M&M, I think on its, on its end. <laughs> I wonder if we can quick pull that up. I wonder, da, 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 da. Yeah, can, yeah. There we go. Wallace and Gromit spaceship. Let's get that. Oh, there we go. Masterpiece. Yep, yep. Oh, oh yeah. I love it. I love it. It's uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, the uh, the spaceship that uh, Tintin flew in. Yes. Uh, which was, you know, I thought that was actually also very well done. Uh, you know, and in there. Yes, there we go. You know, the... Oh, yeah. It was, this is a, not a movie, but a, uh, a graphic novel series uh, from Hergé. Uh, but, you know, there's lots of thought that went into the, the design on how this is supposed to look. And, and again, this is looking a lot like the, um, this, you know, what's coming to pass, the, uh, the Starship from uh, SpaceX. So there's mm -hmm. definitely uh, the very similar lines in the spacecraft. Yep, yep, um, I'll, I'll point out, by the way, um, this version of the Starship is what they are iterating on and, and, and trying to get to uh, flight. Uh, SpaceX has also been selected for funding to uh, make a version of this for uh, lunar access. And so, you know, this vision of, of what this looks like might actually uh, be something that comes to pass where we have this sort of looking thing landing on the moon. 
Is that you now these are all I'm trying all right. to find one from the actual there we go. That shows it landed on the moon. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that that the spaceship, I, I agree with you. I thought in, in Tintin was pretty good. That's another blast from my childhood. I, I specifically remember a year long graphic novel. I think it was in Children's Digest where he was searching for the abominable snowman. And I remember mm -hmm. going to the, the mailbox just waiting, oh, hoping the new issue would come and we could uh, find out what was going to happen to Tintin. Here's an interesting comment uh, again from George Carlyle. Most scientists and engineers feel about science fiction in the media about the way most doctors feel about medical shows, largely not reflective of the reality they know with rare exceptions. Um, as we pointed out, I think there's there's a wide uh, variety um, where like 2001, where clearly it's just brilliantly rendered in, in, in the terms of what might a, a mission with people aboard to a distant place like Jupiter actually look like and how would that work um, both technically as well as for the yeah, you know, the people on board the ship just not to go absolutely berserk, and that's that's <laughs> not not tongue in cheek. That's a very real um, concern, even for traveling somewhere nearby like Mars. Um, you know, personally, and again, we can go back to an example like like gravity. Um, you know, it was you know there are clearly some things you know that would be analogous to a doctor just cringing in terms of how the physics was rendered but in terms of you know storytelling and the potential to inspire young people about the, the thrill and 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 uncertainty and even danger of exploring space um you know there's there's much merit to that and presumably you know young people so inspired will then eventually go into the field and realize ah this is why that kind of a transfer orbit isn't going to work, you know, and and so so I, th I think there's value in these in these things, even if they're depicted in a fanciful way, just in terms of the the potential and the the imagination they inspire, and getting us to think about the possibilities out there. I think all these genre shows suffer from this as well, you know, the lawyer shows and the cop shows, and yeah, right. All right, so that's what I had for slides. Yep. And we brought ourselves, I mean, as you can see here, we're right up to the present since SpaceX is <laughs> working on this. So we'll ask our viewers for any other questions. Um, hope you, you've enjoyed the show. This, uh, this, this has been, a, I think, a good examination of things that have been, you know, everything from the discovery in 2001 to a burning paper plate. There's, there's been a whole <laughs> lot of ways that, that people have imagined space travel, but this, uh, this, uh, this method we have of conveying what's out there in, in artistic and, and narrative ways. Um, as I just said, it's, it's valuable and worthwhile to discuss. We would really like to ask, um, uh, to, to thank uh, Alex for the idea. Um, it's been a fun show to put together and a fun show to do. So I'll just say again, thanks very much for watching. We'll be back next week. Until then, stay well and stay safe. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Some things have popped in on the chat feed. Um, Oh boy, okay. Wait, so first of all, from George, surprise no mention of Fritz Lang's Frau im Mond, which features a spaceship designed by early John German uh, expert Hermann Ober. A good thing to, to mention and an uh, oversight on our part. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I mean, there are, how many films could we have included? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, um, and comment, I really like the space cruise ship from The Fifth Element. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, and it's a question from Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, Alex would like to know what it would look like to build some of these ships in space. That's something you've been thinking about, Gerard, on a, on yes. a slightly different context. Um, tell us about that. So one of the things that I think is important to note is, um, and, and maybe 2001 shows this very well with the, the, the discovery, which is um, you with many of these spacecraft, particularly the things that are designed to go long distances between planets, uh, you don't build them on the ground. Um, you build them actually in orbit where, you know, you don't have to deal with aerodynamic resistance. You don't have to deal with any kind of uh, gravity. Um, you know, the, they could be much more spidery. Uh, in fact, the, we, we have a good example of that with the first, uh, landings on the moon where the crews took down a very spidery looking spacecraft. It didn't have to deal with right. the atmosphere at all. Not and so massive, you know, just massive fuel. You have to, 
you know, I mean, most of the mass you're hauling off the, the gravitational yeah. wall of the earth. Um, yeah. And so uh, in, in reality, we're talking a lot about um, assembling and manufacturing in space and how does that get you capabilities and get you structures and get you uh, physical shapes that you may not be able to ship up inside of the top of a payload shroud. Um, one of the projects I'm working on, in fact, I'm going to go downstairs and work on this right after this coffee, is something in support of where we want to send up a spacecraft that manufactures itself uh, and basically builds a telescope in space. Uh, and it's a lot, it's basically a 3D printer in space. And so you manufacture the structures that hold the optics. The optics themselves you ship up from, from the ground, but they're held by a structure that is built. Someday we'll actually even manufacture the optics in orbit and get to, you know, telescopes the size of football fields that way. Yep. But if you uh, have a really giant mirror in space. That's right. You really can't haul it up in a spacecraft, but think about it. You could just print it. And it could be paper thin because That's it doesn't right. have to deal with gravity. That's right. So. That's right. Um, and we've got a, a one comment. We're going to wrap up here with the final question and final comment. There is a comment that um, you have great cosmic coffee. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. And thought it would be interesting to cover how we do actually get to space in the future. You know, mm. things like space elevators, maglev launchers. We, we could delve into that at some point. There's lots of hypotheses. On I would there are some very interesting topics to cover on that specific front of uh, access okay. and what have people done and what are people trying to do and what are some overlooked ideas? There sure are. So we can cover that in the future one. And then finally, let's just answer the final question, which I, I think would be a good one to end on. Um, why do you think Star Trek, uh, this is from uh, Maka Accounts, why do you think Star Trek became such an iconic cultural phenomenon? What, what's the lightning in a bottle? So I think it may be actually something that people don't appreciate, which was not so much the science and technology of it, but the uh, kind of optimistic and visionary view of the world and of society and how, um, you know, it was multicultural, it was inclusive, uh, it had people of, of all races, it had people of all genders, um, it... Uh, it had a very big tent and it, um, it, uh, I think that that inspired people. And while a frequent trope of individual episodes is to stray from fundamental principles, they did have fundamental principles such as, you know, first contact and, you know, mm -hmm. principles of non-interference and, and that kind of thing. They were, uh, you know, there was a somewhat, naive and utopian approach to things that later series from the original Star Trek series have deviated a bit from. But, uh, you know, they, they tried to paint a very forward-looking uh, view of not just technological development, but human and societal development. That's my take on it. Yep. And um, I, I can say, honestly, no spin, I would have said exactly the same thing. You know, it was the vision of the future and for its time, incredibly progressive. I mean, the yeah. famous first interracial kiss, you know, and, and in that in that era in 1968 um, and per I was growing up in a very race racially charged area. Um, and that was tremendously progressive for the time. And, and for, for that, as well as the topics that they tackled in the episodes, yeah. um, you know, implicitly topics of, um, you know, human warfare and racial tension and, and all of these, these topics of the day, they just waded right into them. And it's really more social commentary and, yeah. and, and a, a optimistic vision. And I think when people sketch out that optimistic vision, that's, that's what we want to hear and, and hold on to and particularly re relevant today in, in the days of, of viruses and fires and hurricanes and, and a year that just doesn't seem to want to quit you know it's those positive visions of the future from visionaries and artists like Gene Roddenberry that that help humanity keep going and it really illustrates the, the, the role of art and storytelling in the progress of civilization. <clears throat> And other series of the time, such as Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, um, had that social commentary element too, and, and were successful because of it, I think, but were more cynical. 
and lacked that optimism, I think, that was in Star Trek. And so that's why I think that Star Trek had more of the sticking power. Right, right. And uh, I think a good example is, you know, the rivalry, say, between uh, Spock and McCoy. Um, you know, McCoy could never quite get the Vulcan, you know, um, a, you know, a, a person and just to be blunt about it, of a different race. And there's this this constant butting of heads. But underlying that is a mutual respect for uh, what they each bring to the enterprise and their their capabilities. And it's a good example of, of how we might behave. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, um, with that, I think we will we will wrap up. Uh, thank you again to Alex for the idea. It's really been a fun show. We'll be back with you next week. Until then, um, um, stay well, stay safe, and, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.